The following program is brought to you by the faithful friends and partners of Gregory Dickow Ministries. Well, I want to welcome you to The Power to Change today. And today we're going to go into Bible school. We're going to have some Bible class. It's going to amaze you. In fact, I've just continued or just completed a teaching series on the grace of God, the amazing grace of God, God's unmerited love and favor that is constantly advancing towards you. You know, that's the thing about God's grace. It's coming at you. It's advancing towards you continually. It's coming after you. We can't go get it. It comes to us. The Bible says goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. Chase you down. God is chasing you down with his goodness, chasing you down with his mercy. Get ready for a teaching on God's grace that will transform your life forever. It is the greatest gift of all. I call it the great exchange. You're going to find out why. Because God's grace is an exchange. He takes our sin and gives us His righteousness. Takes our sickness, gives us His healing. Takes our poverty, gives us His blessing. You name it. Give Him whatever is broken in your life and He'll give you what is whole. Watch this and find out how. And 1 Peter chapter 5, and I want to look at um, verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour, resist him steadfast in the faith. Well, we, that's why we're developing our faith and learning about faith. But he says, resist him steadfast in faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Whatever you're going through, you're not alone. There are other people going through what you're going through. Well, so it, with that being said, go to, go to verse 10. He says, but the God of all grace, everybody say the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, he will make you perfect establish, strengthen, and settle you, and to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. And again, in the Amplified Bible, it says, and after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts all blessing and favor, who has blessed you to his own eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself complete and make you what you ought to be, establish and ground you securely, strengthen and settle you. Well, there's a lot right there in those verses that he himself will complete us. He himself will make us what we ought to be. Amen. He himself will establish us. He will ground us securely. He will strengthen us and he will settle us. And he does that all because all of those things are elements of his grace. That his grace is not just the force that saves us. It is the force. It is his benevolence, it is his generosity, it is his, the overflow of his goodness, which is really what God's grace is. It is the overflow of his goodness coming towards you, constantly coming towards you over and over. You know how the devil is constantly coming against you? Well, God is constantly coming for you. You know how the devil is constantly coming bringing sickness, bringing disease, bringing pain, bringing trouble. Well, God's grace is constantly coming and advancing towards you, bringing blessing, bringing favor, bringing open doors that no man can close, bringing healing, bringing wisdom, bringing answers, bringing solutions. It's constantly advancing towards you. You have to duck to miss God's grace. You have to, I mean, you have to deliberately step out of the way to miss all that God wants to do in your life. This is way easier than anybody has ever imagined because most Christians think we have to pursue and find and get 
and go after and obtain the things that God has towards us. But that's not how God operates because we're not smart enough to pursue, smart enough to obtain, strong enough to reach and, st and stand and hold on to. So his grace comes toward us rather than us having to go find it and get it and seek for it and search for it. He's the one, the Bible says, that he is the son of God and the son of man that came to seek and to save that which was lost. Are you kidding? We're the ones that were lost. People say, I found God. I found God. I found God. How dare we have the pride, the arrogance that we found God that as if we were the smart ones searching and seeking after God. No, he found you. He pursued you. He went after you. And he hasn't stopped coming after you. He's still coming after you. Not to hurt you, not to condemn you, not to judge you. He's coming after you to bless you. He's coming after you to strengthen you. He's coming after you to settle you. He's coming after you to establish you. He's coming after you to empower you. That's the God we serve. It's not even, I think that does him a dis, uh, uh, an injustice to say, to even describe him as the God we serve. That's the God who amazingly, beautifully, sacrificially, humbly, compassionately, benevolently serves us. He was the one that bowed down from heaven and came to this earth and became as a man and became a servant of all men and became obedient and became obedient to the point of death and not just the point of death, death on a cross. My God, he is the one who came and advanced toward us. Man did not bring God to the earth. Man did not even invite him. He came. He pursued. He sought you. He loved you when you were an enemy of God. Now you're his son and his daughter. Do you think he is any less in love with you now? than he was when you were a lost sinner going to hell. You were his enemy and he loved you. While we were enemies, he loved us. While we were aliens, he came and pursued us. And yet after we're saved, we think that the tables are turned and now we have to do all the pursuing. Well, we didn't even do the pursuing to find God. He found us. Now what do we do? Continue to receive just like we received salvation. We heard the word and we believed it and we spoke it and it was so. Why would that change if that's how salvation operates? Why would any why would why would God operate with his other gifts? If the greatest gift of all is received that way freely, then why would any other of God's gifts be received any other way? Do you see? This is. This is the amazing grace, the amazing love, the amazing favor of God. He is the God of all grace and our lack of knowing him as such is what's preventing us. You know, John 17, verse three, if you look there, if you look there, Jesus said, and this is eternal life. John 17, verse three, and this is eternal life that they may know you, the only God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. This is eternal life that they may know you. John 17, verse three. This is eternal life. To know God. Is eternal life. In other words. 
the way to walk in eternal life, the way to experience the God kind of life, the way to experience the kind of life that God created you to experience is simply to know him. Everything that God has for you in this Christian life is an overflow of knowing him. The problem is, is as preachers, our job is to introduce you to God. We're to make an introduction. But we've been introducing, preachers have been introducing people to the wrong God. And I'm not just talking about Muhammad or Buddha. Yeah, those are wrong gods. But Christians have some wrong concepts or people that are Christian based have some wrong concepts of God and they don't really know what God really is like and who God really is. And that's why we need to start with who is God that we would know him so that we know him accurately and correctly. And we just learned in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, he is the God of all grace. First of all, though, above all, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. Any, any type of Christianity or preaching that doesn't draw you to the love of God and doesn't explain or doesn't reveal a dimension of God's love is not true. It's not accurate. It's not biblically based. Someone says, well, what about repentance? People need to repent. They're sinners. They're evil. They're wicked. And they're going to hell and they need to repent. But Romans chapter 2 verse 4 says, it is the love and the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. And the word repent means to change. And it's the love of God that leads us to change. It's literally the it's literally the love of God leading us to change, bringing us to change. Not leading us to then have to decide, to then have to be strong enough, to then have to be strong-willed enough to change. It's the love of God that produces the change. So anything that doesn't relate back to God's love Anything that doesn't relate back to God's grace, anything that doesn't relate back to God's goodness is not a true message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said, I did not come, the Son of Man did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. So if he, if he didn't come to condemn the world of sinners... Jesus didn't come to condemn the world of sinners. He came to save the world of sinners. Then how is it that we are so given to condemnation as Christians when he didn't even come to condemn the world, yet we as Christians are constantly living in condemnation, thinking that God is judging, mad, angry, upset at us because of our imperfections. Come on, are you with me here? He's not upset. He's not offended. He's not mad. He took his wrath. He has, he is a holy God and he is a God of justice and he is a God that, that where equity and fairness must be executed and judgment must be executed because right is right and wrong is wrong. But he took all of his holiness and his wrath and the, and the wrath that comes from his holiness and he poured it on Jesus Christ on the cross. He has none left for those that have embraced his son Jesus. And those that aren't saved are in a holding pattern until they either receive Jesus or they reject him as their last opportunity to be saved. They're in a sort of state of, there's, there's, there's this, there, there is a, a covering of, of grace upon even non-believers, giving them, not saving them, without them receiving Jesus, but giving them an opportunity to be saved before wrath truly shows up in their life. People think, oh, that tornado or that hurricane or that earthquake or that calamity or that tragedy, boy, that was the wrath of God. That was, and insurance companies call it acts of God. What kind of God performs acts like that? He put a rainbow in the, in the, in the sky and said, I'm not flooding the earth anymore. 
So the earthquakes don't come from God and hurricanes don't come. That's not God's punishment. That's not God's wrath. If God was really wanting to get you, <laughs> believe me, he would have got you by now. Oh, don't you remember, though, a few years ago, the, 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 the evil city of New Orleans, Pastor, don't you remember the, uh, what was the hurricane and, and, uh, and, 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 and oh, how evil that that city is. Well, if, if, if that city got a hurricane because they're so evil, why is Las Vegas still standing? <laughs> why is, I mean, think about it. Because we look, we view God today through the eyes of the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is filled with wrath and consequences and curses and judgment. But that is because Jesus had not shown up in the earth yet. Jesus was the lightning rod that took the lightning bolt and took all the wrath and took all the punishment and took all of the pain and took all of your sin and took all of the sickness and took all of the disease so that your house wouldn't be destroyed. A lightning rod attracts, a lightning rod on the top of a house attracts the lightning so that it will go right down through the rod to the, to the ground without affecting anything uh, in, in the home and that's what Jesus does he's the lightning rod he attra attracted all of the all of the curse and all of the pain and all of the the wrath and all of the electricity of God's judgment and all that's left for you is the electricity that gives you light and the electricity that gives you water and the electricity that gives you power and he miraculously saves you he is the ark of Noah he is, I mean, you think about it. He is the, the, the fourth man in the fire of the, of, the four, of, the, of the three Jewish men. He is the, 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 the angel of the Lord in Daniel's lion's den. He is the one who absorbs all of the things that are coming against us. He is the God of all grace. And, in, and as we get our minds renewed to this kind of God, to this is who he is, this is what he's like, we'll, when we get our minds renewed to that, the more we get our minds renewed to that, the more of his goodness that we will begin to expect to show up in our lives. And remember, everything God does, he does with faith. He does through faith. You can't receive anything if you don't receive it by faith. James chapter 1, verse 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So that's why we need to understand who God is. He is the God of all grace. God is love. God is good. And his mercy endures forever. And his goodness and his mercy are following you, pursuing you, chasing you all the days of your life. You're going to wake up tomorrow and realize when you get your mind renewed to the fact that, that his, he's the God of all grace. He's the God of all goodness and mercy. He is the God of love. When you discover that about him, when you believe that about him, when you accept that about him, you expect that from him. You got to accept it about him and it will put into motion an expectation from him. But too many people, there are too many Christians, they're not expecting much good from God. They're just glad to be alive. <laughs> Thank God I'm saved by God's grace. Well, if you could be saved by God's grace when you were a lost sinner going to hell, how much more will you be blessed by God's grace because you're his child? You are his heir. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ, seated with him in heavenly places. And so acceptance, accept the truth about who God is, and you will expect from God all that he promised that he would do. But because a schizophrenic God cannot be relied upon. Right? Did anybody grow up with schizophrenic parents? Don't raise your hand in the front. <laughs> God. 
God is not schizophrenic, meaning he's not one way towards us one day and another way towards us another day. He is faithful. He is consistent. He is love. He is good. It's goodness and mercy following us all the days of our lives. It's not goodness one day and badness the next. It's not grace one day and wrath the next. It's not love one day and hate the next. We've, been in, we've all been in relationships like that with people, haven't we? We've been in relationships with people. Man, man, one day they're the best person on the face of this earth. The next day they're a demon from hell that are, that's out to get you. And green vomit's coming out of their mouth, their head's spinning around. Come on. That's how people are. But that's not how God is. He said, I am the Lord and I do not change. He doesn't change. He doesn't change. So you have to accept the truth about who he is so you can begin to expect the promises that he has made. Because if you, you can't expect the promises from God if you don't accept the character of God. You have to understand the character and the nature of God to be able to expect what what he's going to do. You know, when you know somebody's character, you can, you can expect, correctly expect what they're going to do, right? Oh man, she's always late. Oh man, he's always, you know, he's always mad. Oh man, she always does this, or she always does that, or he always does this, right? That's somebody's character, what you've come to expect from them. A person's character is what we've come to expect from them over time through repeated behavior. Well, if you look at the Bible and see God's repeated behavior in the New Testament, and the only, the, the greatest picture of what God is like is Jesus. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? So when we've, if we look at the life of Jesus, what, what did he do? He consistently and he fed the multitudes, and he consistently, and he healed them all, and he consistently, and he showed compassion towards every one of their sick, and he laid hands on every one of them, and as many as touched him, they were healed. And we can go on and on and look at the consistency of God's nature and God's character based on the life of Jesus and what Jesus did. That is a picture of the kind of God that we get to call our Father. And as you begin to get that picture of Him, that builds in you an expectation of what you can expect from Him. My kids, they had certain expectations of me when they were younger. When they're little, they expected me to meet all of their needs. As they got older, I began to introduce to them the concept that I am not the Lord. <laughs> and I didn't write Philippians 4.19. <laughs> and, and, and so they began to, so when they were little, and they'll tell you, they expected everything from me. If they needed anything, wanted anything, they got it because I was their provider and their mother of course we were their sole provider but as they got older they they began to expect less from us and more from God right and now if we did our job good they'll expect less from us and more from God if we did our job bad they'll expect less from us and they won't expect much from God either so that's you know that'll <laughs> that'll pan out over the next few weeks months and years in their lives but they, they, they begin to set their expectations on God who is, who is like what, what we were as parents when they were little babies taking care of every one of their needs. That's how God is today. Well, as we close out today's program on the amazing grace of God, amazing grace, how sweet the sound isn't it a sweet sound? There's no greater sound than that, than to know that God loves you unconditionally, that God's not mad at you, He's mad about you, that His grace is advancing towards you. 
I love this verse that we just went over in this teaching in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, for your sake, no matter who you are, no matter how broken you are, no matter how bad life has been, for your sake, he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might be made rich. That's not just rich in money. That's rich in every area of your life. In fact, God wants you to experience the riches of his grace. We've put this collection together, the riches of his grace, so that you can walk in these riches, so you can walk in this abundance, so you can walk in this amazing grace, so you can walk in this unmerited love and favor. Are you ready for God to open doors that no man can close? Watch this and find out how. Call now for the four CD series, The Grace of God. Witness God's favor and blessings overtake every area of your life when you learn how to live in the grace of God. And for your gift of any amount, you will also receive the two CD series, How to Have Faith. Obtain mountain-moving, lion-taming, fire-quenching faith in operation in your everyday life. Call now. Our offer of the month, Victory Over Stress, is designed to prevent you from being paralyzed by stress and the pressures of life. For your gift of $30, you'll receive the four-disc CD series, Conquering Stress Forever. As you apply these tools from the Word of God, you will gain control over stress from your life once and for all. You will also receive the single-disc message, Perfect Peace. God's peace. Call now for the four CD series, The Grace of God. Witness God's favor and blessings overtake every area of your life when you learn how to live in the grace of God. And for your gift of any amount, you will also receive the two CD series, How to Have Faith. Obtain mountain-moving, lion-taming, fire-quenching faith in operation in your everyday life. Call now in your life? Then visit www.gregorydickow.org today. With easy navigation, you can watch previous episodes of the Power to Change Today show. Sign up to receive Gregory Dickow's, sign up to receive Gregory Dickow's podcasts. Be encouraged by powerful articles, view testimonies, keep informed how you are helping to change other people's lives, and so much more. Visit gregorydickow.org and experience a change in your life today. If you are ever in the Chicagoland area, we want to invite you to join us for a powerful church service at one of our campuses. Our beautiful Northwest Suburb campus is conveniently located on the northwest corner of I-90 and Beverly Road in Hoffman Estates. Or join us at our downtown Chicago campus located at Whitney Young High School on the corner of Jackson and Loomis. For service times or more information, visit lifechangerschurch.com. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and partners of Gregory Dickow Ministries.